Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. <clears throat> it is a privilege and an honor to um, uh, make my expertise available to inform current debate about uh, Galamse. And I want to humbly state that I do this with, with passion, not to spike people, but I have seen the ravages of cancer. I have seen the effect of what this toxicity can do to people. And if you tell me there are families out there who are suffering on account of this, and you will see in the presentation that uh, but Samson has done that. So first of all, there are a lot of models about cancer. We've got logistic, uh, regressional models, several models. Uh, uh, WHO, EPA, FDA, I'm talking about the U.S. apparels of what we have in Ghana, use this model that I'm going to use to explain the prevalence of this exposure and how it affects all of us. The first one is that there is what we refer to as the single hit model of carcinogenesis. Now the core principle is that a single molecular hit to a DNA from a, to a genotoxic agent can initiate cancer. Hmm. Okay, a single exposure to, and I'm using arsenic. A single molecular hit. Exactly. To your DNA. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. A single one. Now, the, there's a mathematical model here I would have shown, but it's not projected. I've given hmm. it to the producer. So yes, I'm I'll sure they're working on, on it. Uh, produ production, kindly project this quickly for us. Yes. yes. Go on. You just go on. Ask me. So, 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 um, so exposure, therefore, is directly proportional to the dose without and with a non-zero threshold okay uh, the second point is that arsenic binds to sulfhydryl uh, groups and substitutes phosphates in the dna that's because arsenic and phosphorus have similar um, um, properties chemical properties so that is where it begins to attack it induces oxidative stress um, uh, it, some, for example, some DNA strands can break. There are different form of that breakages or mutation that can occur, and so when it happens on um, a gene suppressor, for example, uh, TP53 or KRAS, then it it can easily escalate into a permanent mutation it can easily escalate into a permanent mutation. On account of that, for genotoxins, we prefer not to have any benchmark. We don't have any threshold on account of that. So that is if an, a toxicant, a contaminant is a genotoxin, then it is not supposed to have a regulatory threshold. So all attempts, we use what we call uh, as low as possible, as low as practicable in order to reduce it. That is because a single molecule is likely to induce carcinogenesis. Now at the population level, a lot of, as for Bangladesh, and Taiwan, those countries, they, uh, this theory or this model has been validated. And so we refer to it as the linear uh, risk uh, because exposure to the toxicant is linear. The more you are exposed to it, the higher um, the mutagenicity or the incidence of cancer is likely to occur. For the case of arsenic, you have skin, bladder, lungs. Um, um, there, is, it, there is a continuous risk. And so this model is also referred to as linear, non-threshold um, um, a model. Linear, non-threshold model. Um, the, we have what we refer to as potency factor. All toxicants, especially uh, genotoxic substances, have uh, a potency factor, and values are given to them. So we multiply the potency factor by the exposure 
uh, or the yes exposure level in order to quantify the magnitude of risk according to us epa fsa uh, who standards now the policy implication is that there should be as far as possible as far as possible and non a zero exposure what it means is that every single exposure is likely to escalate the risk that any person is exposed to mm. now uh, we did a study in in uh, the volta region kgb and published it and we had some interesting i use this as an example because um the um it is supposed from the listening i have done that in the volta region there is no galamsey right so we we went to the place and picked up some baby food samples and charlie look at what we are seeing in volta Okay, in the Volta region, mm. KJB, we picked, I don't want to mention the brand name so that we can we will destroy people's business. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to inform the debate. And the argument here is that, look, you may not be in a galam zone, but the food supply chain runs throughout the whole country. So if you are in Accra, you source your food from a Galamse area because we don't do intensive agriculture, so to speak. In you refer to Kajabi in the Uti region? Yeah, okay. uh, uh, yes. Mm. We, do, we don't, you don't, the food, we have the pockets where Galamse is hotspotted are the very pockets that we have high agricultural productivity. So we have our wholesalers, and and bulkers going to these rural areas to bring food for those of us in the urban centers mm, to mm, eat mm. and that is where you are not spared if you are in accra you are in kumasi or you are in any urban center and you are eating and drinking water you are putting yourself at risk because galamse goes into the food and then it is brought to the cities for you to eat um, so we found quite significant... Well, already they can't treat our water. They <laughs> exactly. Okay, you go when it comes to the water systems, mm. in fact, I have pictures of... I'm in Winneba. Every single day, senior members, community members are all drinking brown water consistently. Today, yesterday, every day. And you have no... You see, the rich people can afford to dig their own wells get their own your friends say uh, solar energy and do their own process plants in their house you and i cannot do that we have one ghana and we buy they can afford to buy bottled water avian etc but we can't afford to do that and it that is what is making me very passionate mm. about this advocacy okay. mm. continuing with that so we found very significant levels i wouldn't spend too much time it has been projected mm. we we saw exposure levels to be very significant we found health risk levels also to be very what significant for a toxicant that is supposed to be have are you no still threshold. talking about the non galamse area so now you're talking about yeah i have switched to the slides okay. before okay. i was expatiating on mm. how if you are not in a galamse zone mm. you are still at risk that's right because you source mm. your food yeah. from areas mm. our food baskets mm. where galamse is right. grown. so yeah. when the food comes the crops uptake these toxicants and they stay in it and the funny thing is that it bioaccumulates in you mm. the more every time you are eating it is the levels of these toxicants are building up in you so that is the argument and then for water systems our processing plants have already filled us in Winneba, where i work and live we have never had clean water for only god knows how long since last year up to now we have never had all the water we drink is brown and it is exposing children school children the next generation 
So the argument here I am making is that galamse, for example, arsenic leaches into rivers, soils, and fish. Now, the, another thing too associated with that, exposure is multiple. Mm. QuickBooks gives me the superpower to automate my invoices, track expenses, and get paid fast so I can get back to what I love. Get more done in less time with QuickBooks Online. A breeze. Mm. It is also responsible for, uh, it's also, it can, it's also a, an exposure route. Then we have Dema. This one is particularly important for our youth who are in the river bodies uh, mining Galamsey. Their skin is exposed to these toxicants and it can generate a lot of damage for them. Yeah. So what we are calling for here is that we can see that there is an existential threat, existential threat on the water that we drink to the food that we eat and even now the air that we are breathing. Article 31 clause 9 of the Constitution says that when there is an existential threat to the life of the community. The president is mandated to use the legal tools of a state of emergency to help this. Now, I want to tie this in with the law. Just one second. You see, when a community is at risk, the president is supposed to address it. But when the operations of Galamse involve armed operators, and a lot of operation, hit operation, vanguard, all kinds of operations have come and gone. Now, the reason why a state of emergency is invoked, Samson, is that it gives the president the powers to be efficient whilst protecting human rights. Okay. But if, for example, this campaign that is being rolled out, very soon you will see Human rights infringements will come to the fore. Mm. That is because the current operations that has been deployed by the Minister of Interior, it, it operates under the normal tools of governance that the Constitution has given. Mm. So it is easy to trigger a human rights infringement. And when people bring it against you, they will succeed. Yeah. So the framers of the Constitution foresaw this. That when, and you see, the, Galams, uh, the state of emergency as defined by Article 31 does not call for the president to in, call for a nationwide uh, state of emergency. Look at the hotspot areas. Right. Targeted. Right. Target them. Okay. Thank you. So that, uh, uh, please give me a second. Mm. So the advocate, what we are calling for is that a state of emergency will give the president reprieve the legal environment for the president to first of all halt the activities of these armed racketeers right. okay. then recovery livelihood uh, um, uh, uh, interventions can effectively be deployed all right i am happy about the fact that thank you thank you uh, uh, dr ekpo and yima aka um